He was obedient to his calling. Not a lot of people do it. A lot of people miss God because they're not obedient to the calling. This young brother is obedient to his calling. And he's doing some wonderful things for the Lord. And he represents his family and Turning Point Church well. You know, I get a little emotional because I'm, I'm pretty close to Toby. And, you know, we talk, you know, every now and then, but it's just the things that come out of him and how he relates to the youth. Brother, you're going to do some things with the youth in this country. You hear me? You are. You already started, but you, you ain't seen nothing yet. I seen him speaking to the life of my son when he came home here from um, the Navy and just watch him just receive that. It just blew me. So... I'm not going to belabor you. We are all excited. We stand and ready to receive this young man of God as he comes to minister. Help us welcome Toby Adewato. How are you guys doing? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Awesome. How are you guys doing this morning? Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, I did not plan on preaching in Nigerian attire this morning. That's okay. Um, but because it is my mother's birthday, um, you see us dressed up. Uh, Mom, we uh, celebrate you today. Uh, we love you. Um, we honor you. Um, for who you are and the impact that you've had on our lives. Um, so I'm really glad that, you know, I could come uh, just be around family today, um, but also be back with the church family and just um, dive into the word of God with you guys. Uh, if you guys want to stand with the reading of the God's word, we're going to be in Deuteronomy uh, 31. So if you have your Bibles, turn around to uh, Deuteronomy um, 31. Going to dive right in here. Uh, so, this is Deuteronomy 31. Uh, I am reading from the ESV, um, and we're going to go verses 1 through 13 here. So, Moses continued to speak these words to all of Israel. Verse 2 And he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I am no longer able to go out and come in. The Lord has said to me, You shall not go over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you so that you shall dispossess them. And Joshua will go over at your head as the Lord has spoken. And the Lord will go to them as he did to Shion and Og, the king of the Amorites, and to their land when he destroyed them. And the Lord will give them over to you. And you shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I have commanded you. Verse 6, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him, in the sight of all Israel, be strong and courageous. For you shall, all, for you shall go with these people into the land the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them. And you shall put them in, your, put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who, give, who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Verse 9. Then Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of the Levites, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, at the end of every seven years, at the set time in the year of release, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord, your God, at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and the little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, and be careful to do all the words of this law and their children who have not known it. May hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as you live in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. Amen. Amen. 
you guys can go ahead and be seated. So just to give you guys a little background um, on the passage, we're in, in the book of Deuteronomy. The purpose of Deuteronomy was um, really to reestate the covenant to the people of God. Um, a new generation was about to enter into the promised land, and they hadn't heard the law before. And so Moses knows that he will not enter into the promised land, so he takes this opportunity uh, to give them the word, um, the law that they had not heard before. And so at the beginning, he begins to just give a, a review of the text and reviews, you know, what God has done for his people, right? And then he encourages them um, to follow the law. And then he gives this new generation that has not heard the law before, he gives them the law for the first time in their context before they enter into uh, the promised land. And uh, before we dive in, I just want to take a moment to pray, um, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Lord, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we acknowledge you. Um, God, you are uh, a God who never fails us. God, you are a God that's here with us right now. You are ever present. And God, we just pray that you would speak to our hearts today. Lord God, that you would uh, illuminate the word to us, God, that Holy Spirit, you would just be in our midst and speak to your people, God. Um, speak to me, God, even as I, I deliver this word, God. We just want to hear your voice, God. Uh, we want to be changed by you, God. Uh, we want to glorify your name with our lives, Lord. And so I pray as I speak, God, that you would do that today. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. So I think a lot of times we need to take time to just sit back uh, and reflect on our lives and just see what God is doing uh, more than anything else. Uh, these past couple of years of my life have not been necessarily what I expected them to be, um, but I think following God is the most amazing journey uh, that you can ever go on, right? Um, and so the, following the Lord the past couple of years, um, I did work uh, on Wall Street in New York, which was an amazing experience, um, but the Lord kind of shifted that direction, and uh, that direction has led me to Chicago um, the past year. And so I've been working, I just started a new job about two and a half months ago uh, in Chicago, and I work for a ministry called GRIP. Um, so GRIP, uh, G stands for gospel, R stands for relationships, E stands for immersion, and P stands for prayer. Uh, and so the work that we're doing in Chicago is very interesting. Um, I really didn't know the landscape of Chicago until I got there. Uh, I just felt like the Lord had opened the doors there for things in my life and felt like it was the next step. Um, but when you dive deep into the landscape of Chicago, what you see is that 40% of the students there do not graduate high school. 47% um, of African-American males between the age of 20 and 24 are out of work or out of school, right? Um, the, People say that Chicago is one of the my most diverse cities, um, but also it is uh, very segregated. So your, your neighborhoods change within five to 10 minutes. The landscape can be totally different, right? Um, and the work that we're doing, we're working with teenagers from across the city. We focus on high schoolers, um, and it is the most amazing thing that, that I've seen. It's, we put on a high energy youth night for them every single Monday, get about 100 students. Um, these are things that you don't hear in the, in the news, but God is moving, right? God is moving um, in Chicago, and he's doing something really, really special. And what we believe more than anything is in life-on-life -life relationships, right? So we believe that the impact of our lives, walking with a teenager from these inner-city environments can change their lives, right? Um, that we have a, if I, if I have an influence in someone's life, and my life is only about Jesus, then they're going to get nothing else but Jesus, right? And that's what Jesus said. He, said. he said, come follow me. He lived life intimately with his disciples, and that's what we really believe in. But also why I've been working for this organization, um, I've been in school part-time at Moody Theological Seminary. And this past, uh, this past semester, I got to take a class um, called hermeneutics. And my, my teacher, uh, our last exam, Right? We dove into the passage of, of Matthew um, when Jesus begins to preach the gospel. Uh, so it's actually Matthew 4, um, and it's Matthew 4, 12 through 17. And if you look at the last verse, um, verse 17, it says, Jesus began to preach the gospel, saying, Repent, for, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? But we stopped and we began to really dig through that passage and really trying to find out the meaning. And I think there's a very interesting line at the beginning that we, we dove into. Um, and in verse 12, it said, 
Now we heard that John had been arrested and he withdrew to Galilee. Okay? Um, so as we dove into this passage, what we were really understanding was that the beginning of Jesus' ministry also signaled the end of John the Baptist's ministry. Okay? So John the Baptist was the forerunner, right, that went and, and pro- proclaimed the name of Jesus that the one was coming. Okay? That Jesus Christ was coming. And so in order for Jesus' ministry to begin, John the Baptist's ministry actually had to come to an end. And after, the, after that exam, my professor took us outside. Um, he pointed to a, to a plaque that was inscribed in the, in the building, and it said 1886. Uh, and so that's when Moody was actually founded. And so my professor's message was really that this school existed long before I came here, and it will exist long before after me as well. Right? And what he was really trying to get, uh, get to us more than anything was that we're just playing a small part in God's story. Right? There's this big picture of what God is doing. And even when we look into the text, I love one of my professors used to say about the Bible, it's his story. Right? right? Just the story of what God has done for mankind and to redeem mankind. Right? And so my heart began to stir more than anything else. And, and it's just simply like, who cares about, honestly, frankly, this is just me, but who cares about Toby, right? Who's going to know, who's going to know Toby 200 or 300 years from now, right? That's, that's awesome. That's great. But the reality is the name of Jesus has been here for thousands of years, right? And so we're just playing a big part, right? But from generation to generation to generation, the name of Jesus is still relevant, right? It has nothing to do with us more than anything else. And so that's, that's my hope more than, more than anything else. And as we looked into this passage, um, if you could just throw that first slide up there, um, you know, the title of today's message is simply just like, what will you pass on, right? What type of legacy will you leave um, in, this, in this generation? What will you pass on to the next generation? And I think Moses, um, as he was passing this off to, to Joshua, I think he gives us kind of a blueprint of some of the ideals that are important for us to pass on to the next generation, right? Um, So we're just going to dive in verses 1 through through 3. You can go ahead and actually go to uh, the slide before this, right? And I think one of those big ideals that that Moses left with with the generation was simply, you can trust in the Lord, right? And so why can you trust in the Lord? And I think we find that in this text here if you look at uh, verse 1 through 3. So Moses continued to speak these words, and he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I am no longer to go out and come in. The Lord has said to me, you shall not go over this Jordan. The Lord, your God himself, will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you, so that you you shall dispossess them. And Joshua will go over at your head as the Lord has spoken. And if you can imagine Moses in this sequence, right? not being able to enter into the promised land and what Moses has seen, right? Moses saw that his people were enslaved, right? And the Lord told him that he was going to raise him up as a deliverer, right? And Moses was shocked. He said, how can I be used? And then the Lord encouraged him, said to him that he would use him. And then you see Moses go out, right? He delivers his people, the amazing uh, miracle of the Red Sea, leads his people into the wilderness, Right? It's been this amazing journey, and then now he's 120 years old, but the Lord says, you will not enter into the promised land. Right? And, and I think that um, I love the character of, of the biblical character of Moses in the Bible. Right? The Bible says about Moses that he was a very meek man, more than all, all people on the face of the earth. Right? Or at the end of Deuteronomy, it says, and there is no prophet that's risen in Israel like Moses whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all these signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do, right? And the reality here is, again, just as I said, Moses is just playing a big part in God's story, right? It's it's, When we look at this text, we're supposed to see the character of who our God is. And I think the most important thing that he's saying here is he's saying that I will go before you, Right? I will go before you. This is what the Lord has spoken, and we can take him at his word, right? It's a human leader, but the, what, what marked um, the people more than anything else is that they were going with God, 
right? That's, that was always what the nation of Israel was supposed to be. They were supposed to be a people that were a testimony of who God was, right? And that's what made them different. That's what, that's what Moses is saying in, the, in this passage, is it's not, it's not about me. It's not about the human leader, right? It's about the presence of God that is going before you and with you. And we need to hold on to that, knowing that we can trust God because he goes with us, right? It's not in my strength, right? It's not that I, I, I preach the word. It's the presence of God that's in my life, right, that I hope that people see more than anything else, right? Has anybody ever noticed when God simply just invades a room or he invades into a conversation? I can tell that immediate switch, right? I can tell that immediate switch when the Lord is in the midst of something. You sense it and you know it, right? I was just walking outside the other day, and I was like, I'm going to go take a time to pray. And then I, immediately as I walked out, uh, I ran into my neighbor that just moved in upstairs, and we started talking. And so in my head, I was just like, hey, I'm just going to ask him, like, um, you know, are there any prayer requests, anything I can pray for for you, right? Thinking I'm, I'm just going to evangelize to him, see where he's at spiritually. Um, and the Lord came and took over the conversation. Not on, not on my end like I expected. The, he started ministering to me, right? I was like, I, and, and, but the reality was the Lord came and he started, he started sharing his testimony with me. He started telling me about how his sister was a prayer warrior and they had just been praying. Like, that's an example when I know, oh, this is not what I expected this conversation to be. But the Lord came in and he took that over. Right. The presence of God is what changes us. And the presence of God is what was going to lead these people into the promised land. Right. Think about Isaiah, the presence of God. Literally, he had an encounter with the Lord and that changed him for the rest of his life. Right. You want to know what happened to me? I just had an encounter with the Lord, and it changed my life, right? It's the presence of God that changes who we are. As Christians, our testimony is that not my strength, not who I am, but I walk with the Lord. I know the living God that goes before me, right? And that's what Moses was saying here, right? That's what Moses was trying to get across. We can trust the Lord because he goes before us, right? He goes before us. It's the presence of God that marks us and leads us. Um, continuing, verse six, I mean, verse four through six, okay? Uh, and the Lord said to them, as he did to Sean and Og, the king of the Amorites, into their land when he destroyed them, the Lord will give them over to you. And you shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Right? And so now Moses is giving them a reminder, like, remember what God has done. Right? He led you into this position. Right? And he'll fight for you again. You know, that's the beauty of, of what it's saying here. He destroyed them. Right? The Lord destroyed your enemies before, and he will do that again. Right? God fights for us, and we can trust him because of that. Right? It's the sovereignty of God that's so beautiful and that's amazing. Yeah. Right? That the Lord fights for us. Does anybody know and resonate with that in their lives? Yeah. Right? That the Lord has gone before you. Right? And he's fought for you. He's opened doors. He's shut doors. Right? I can reflect on it in my life and there's just certain times where I just like, out of a situation, it's like the Lord went before me. God, I know you're fighting for me. Right? Whether it's in a conversation that he changes it. I don't know if it's at, at your workplace. Right? I don't know if it was with your finances. I don't know if it was with housing. Right? But the Lord fought for you, and he went before you. And I think that's the ideal that Moses is trying to get this generation to understand. is like, you can trust the Lord. Because number one, he goes before you. And number two, he will fight for you. Right? These are truths that we should pass on to the next generation. Right? And we'll make our way down, continuing to verse 7. Um, verse 7 through 9 here. Okay. Uh, you can actually go to the next. Go back. You can just leave it on this slide. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the next ideal that I think Moses was really leaving in this generation's hands was like, you can find strength and courage in the Lord. All right? You can find strength and courage in the Lord. All right? So Moses is actually passing the torch to Joshua here. And he says, 
Then Moses summoned Joshua and, and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall, do, you shall go with these people into the land that the Lord has shown to your fathers to give to you, and you shall put them in possession. Right? And this is the character of God that I think Moses is, is fighting for more than anything for us to recognize. Right? The Lord is with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Beautiful promises of God. Right? We need to understand the character of who our God is. Right? This is a God that, that and I, I love reflecting on just, sometimes we have to remember the character of God. You know, in the midst of your situation, you have to remember that God is who he says he is. He's not a man that he should lie. He never changes. What God says about himself in this book never changes. If God says he's faithful, then he doesn't change. Right? And that's what he's encouraging, jo uh, uh, encouraging Joshua with here more than anything else. Yeah. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Right? Yeah. The Lord is faithful. Yeah. I love how the Bible talks about the Lord's faithfulness. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 says... If we are faithless, he is faithful. For he cannot deny himself. 2 Timothy 2, 13. Right? A promise I always claim more than anything else. Um, right? He will complete the work that he started in you. Yes. Right? Yes. It's not up to me. I rest on the faithfulness of who my God is. Right? I remember who my, what the character of my God is. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. No matter what the circumstances I find myself in, my God remains the same and he never changes. Right? And I think sometimes we have to take a step back and we need to take, we need to say that the, take the things that are going on in our lives and we need to bring them under the character of God. Because sometimes what we begin to do, I did it when I got to Chicago. I said, hey, this is my plan. Right. This is what, uh, you know, God, I feel like you're calling me to Chicago, but this is what I want it to look like, you know. And a year later, it looks totally different. <laughs> right. It looks totally different. But then I see the sovereign hand of God in it. Yes. Right. And so for me, I have to let go of my expectations and what I want. Right. And say that, God, you're good and you're faithful, regardless of my expectations. Right. I remember I was in college one time and I went on a job interview and, and then they called me back and they told me I didn't get it. But my immediate response was there's a, there was just a peace in my heart because God, you're good. Like, God, you're faithful. God, you open and you close doors regardless. And you're going to put me where I need to be. And I can rest in that more than anything else, right? So God is not good if you get that car. God is not good if you get that house. God is not good because of all those things. God is good because that's who he is and that's who's his character, right? Right? And so in our lives, in our circumstances, in our situations, we need to begin to take our thoughts and what's going on in our lives and submit those to the character of God and who he says he is. Right? And I think that's what Moses is saying in this text more than anything. Right? You in your life can always find strength and courage in the Lord because he is with you and he never leaves you. Right? And I love this passage as well as he's passing it on to, to, to Joshua, the next generation here. Right? And my life, more than anything I love, is the fact that as I grow, you know, I'm the youngest of three brothers, and I think the beautiful, the beautiful thing of it is that I always get to just see their lives. I get to see what mistakes they, they make, and I, <laughs> right? But that's, but the wisdom, the wisdom is really like people went before you, they made mistakes, right? You take that so you don't have to do the same thing, right? And so my life is always in a situation, though, that as I grow, though, just like my brothers go before me, I always want to reach back and see, find, find a younger man that I'm like, man, I was where you are. Let me tell you what I learned, right, so that you can take it and not make the same mistakes that I made, right? I want to take on my lessons. I want to pass them on to the next generation, right? Like, that's the beauty of my mother. When I think about my mother more than anything, right, like, we get to celebrate her more than anything, but I knocked, on, I knocked on my mom's door because I've been a little bit under the weather this, this uh, past couple of days. And I knocked on my mom's door for some green tea. I was like, Mom, where's the green tea, right? When you leave the house and you come back, you don't know where things are, right? <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, Mom, like, where's the green tea? 
and lo and behold, you know, and, and this is the faithfulness of, of just my mom's life and who she is, and she's just sitting there reading her Bible. And I'm like, what are you reading? You know, and she's like, you know, I just got done reading Isaiah, right? But when I look at my mom's life more than anything, it's the, what she's passed on to me is, on, is her faith, on, right? Like, right? Right? A, a legacy, you know, something of, of faith. And, like, I look at my life and what I want to pass on to my gen the next generation is just my faith. Yeah. Like, know Jesus. Yeah. Right? Like, know the person that created this world. Know who he is. Mm. Right? You can't. We run around in our entire lives and we're always trying to figure out what to do and what the meaning of this life. It's like, it's something that's deep within us. Mm. Right? And my foundational thing is, like, you can't know that apart from God. You, you can't know what you're supposed to do apart from your creator. Yes. You, just, you, you, just, yes. you just keep going, ending up running around in circles, right? Yes. Right? You know God, and then you will know your purpose and why he created you. Like those things, those things go together, right? And so when I look at my mom's life more than anything, it's like, man, like, you, you, like, she doesn't know how much I use her in my testimony whenever I'm speaking. Like, she's a spiritual backbone, Come on. right? And, like, I would not have my faith without my mother. Come on, and so my, my prayer and my hope more than anything is that I'm able to pass on my faith to my kids and to the next generation, yes, sir. right? Like, know Jesus. Know Jesus more than anything else, right? Um, you can go ahead and, and skip to the next slide here, um, the next one, right? And then I think the, 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 the third ideal that Moses left uh, in this text with the next generation was you must hold on to the word of the Lord, right? So if you, if you look at Deuteronomy 31 here, uh, verses 9 through 13, Moses wrote the law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant and, and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, at the end of every seven years, at the set time in the year of release, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, the little ones, the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God. And be careful to do all the words of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as you live in this land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. Right? So Moses instructs the priests to read, to read um, the law here and to write it down. So it had always been verbal. The law had always been repeated. That's why the people would memorize the law, and they repeat it to the next generation. Um, but here, Moses, this is the first time that he instructs them to write it down. Um, but the word of God is everything, right? It is, it's, it's our mirror, you know? The Bible is actually, uh, if you look at it in the, the Hebrew, it's, it's, our, it's the rod, it's our measuring stick, right? We measure ourselves versus the word of God, right? We get to figure out who the character of God is, right? Sharper than a two-edged sword. Right? Our, the, the word of God shows us where our, our heart is at. Right? Amen. And more than anything else, Amen. he's saying to this next generation, like, hold on to this. Hold on to the word. Right? Read the word. Hear the word. Yeah. Right? That's why we come to church, yeah. to hear the word. Yeah. Right? It's, it's one of the, the biggest things is we have to hold on to this text because we get to figure out who our Lord is. Yeah. The Bible changes us as we sit down and read it. Every single time, you might not understand what is going on, but you will continue to grow. You know, we, we, we spend time at the Lord's feet. We get to know who he is, right? If someone says something about God, but it doesn't match up with what's in this text, then that's not correct, right? We need to know the word of God. We need to, hold, we need to know who he is. We need to hold on to his law, right? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. Um, you know, Moses, in this text, he realized that he's about to die. He commissions Joshua. They record the law. Um, but Moses prepared the people for his departure, right? Moses knew that it's, it's not about these people be, being dependent on me. I'm just a human leader. And so it goes so far beyond me, 
right? We teach people not to be dependent on ours, who we are, but we teach people to have a personal relationship with God and know who he is, know who Jesus is, right? Um, you know, and I was, as I was uh, thinking um, just the other day, um, I, was, I was scrolling through Facebook uh, and I saw someone's devotion there. Um, and I was like, man, it matches up perfectly in line with, with, with my thought pattern for what I wanted to share today, right? But I couldn't find that devotion online. Um, so I actually just like took a picture of it and threw it in a slide. Um, so if you can go, if you can go ahead and, and uh, yeah. Um, so the, this was a, it was a devotion on ambition. And uh, she was just, it was just talking about the difference between godly ambition um, and selfish ambition or worldly ambition, right? And so ambition is not a bad thing. And I think this is something that a lot of times I wrestle with is just, I'm a very ambitious person, right? And so what does it look like to have godly ambition versus worldly ambition, right? And there's two different things. And so what it, what it talked about here was just um, basically like, this is how you can judge yourself, whether this is godly ambition or selfish ambition. But I think the beauty of it, as I saw it here, the last line here, it says, um, godly ambition, right, thinks about the next generation. Selfish ambition indulges in this generation, right? So the reality of it is if you have a godly ambition, it's really um, what are you trying to pass on to the next generation? And my heart here more than anything that's stirring in my heart is that what we pass on to the next generation is Christ, right? It's not gener like generational wealth is awesome. Education is awesome. Like we need those things, right? Even the kingdom of God, right? You see this in every sector, right? We need to be in every sector, right? You need money to make ministries run, right? We need money to push forward the kingdom of God, right? So I'm not saying those things are, are bad, but I'm saying that apart from Christ, and if Christ is not the center, then all those things are in vain, right? If I can educate someone, right? Like I work with students right now, and my job is to help them um, transition, jobs, internships, professional development, all those type of things. But if you don't know Jesus, right, if you don't know who the King of Kings is, right, if you don't know that God created you in a loving relationship and loves you so much that he wants to spend eternity with you, right, but apart from, but, uh, uh, you cannot get to, to live with God forever apart from Jesus Christ, right? Because all of us, right, will stand before God and the, the, the Bible says that our righteousness is filthy rags, right? So it's not a checklist, right? And don't think about Christianity that way. It's not a checklist of whether I do right or what I do wrong, right? It's about having a personal relationship with Jesus. I tell people all the time, like, I'm not, it's not about what you do. I'm not really worried about that, right? Do you know Jesus, right? I was sitting in a, in a car with someone, and she began to just break down her life to me, and she began to talk about all these things that were going wrong in her life. And I was just like, Jesus, right? Your problem is Jesus. I'm not worried about your sin and what you're doing wrong, right? Because Jesus will take care of that. What you, what you need to understand more than anything, right, is that you were created to know God and you were created to have a personal relationship with God. And the only way that you're able to have a personal relationship with God is through his son, Jesus Christ. Right? That's what he died for. He died so that you could know God. My mom would always say, God told me this or God told me that. I'd be like, what are you talking about? Right? What are you talking about? But do you know that the God that created the heavens and the earth wants to walk with you in a personal and intimate way, and he wants to speak to you? Right? But apart from Jesus, that doesn't happen. Right? Right? And to bring, you know, just, you know, even my, my barber, I was sitting there talking to my barber a couple weeks ago, and he was just like, it was a really funny conversation. Um, he had talked, to, he started talking, uh, I just started talking about my life, and he was basically saying, hey, um, he asked me what church I go to, I told him what church I go to, um, then he suggested a church, um, but as we, we kept talking, uh, I was like, how are you going to tell me to go to that church, like? Like, you wouldn't even go to church, right? <laughs> I'm like, you know? But, but the reality is, the reality as we, we continue to have that conversation, he's just telling me I'm packing his faith, and he's like, man, I grew, up, I grew up with my faith. They told me to never question it, right? And I'm like, 
question it, like figure it out, like know what you believe in, right? But then at the same time, he was like, but I can't go back on it because everything is pointing to it like that it's real, you know? And I'm like, yeah, like Jesus has lasted forever, right? That's why we still talk about Jesus thousands of years later because he's real. That's why it's B.C. and A.D., before Christ, right? Or, or Anno Domine, right? The year of the Lord, right? Everything points to Jesus. Yes, he's real, right? That's all that matters is that we pass that on to our next generation, right? Like, that's what's stirring in my heart. Like, who cares about my life? Like, I just want people to know Jesus. I hope I pass it on to the next generation, right? Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide here. You know, I, I was just thinking about, like, how do we apply this word? How do we apply this text? Um, and so in Deuteronomy 31, I mean, in Deuteronomy, the whole text here, we have, um, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to go to a, to a famous passage. Um, this is Deuteronomy 6. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. Um, this is Deuteronomy 6, uh, verses 4 through 9, right? Um, this text is called the Shema, right? And the Shema uh, was, it comes from a Hebrew word that means to hear, right? So we were talking about hearing the word of God. And the Jews, they would recite the Shema in the morning and in the evening. And the religious Jews, they would recite this passage um, three times, actually, each, each day, right? And so the importance of the Shema, one of the things that I really wanted to bring out here uh, more than anything else. This is, the version I have up here actually is the NLT. Uh, and it just says, listen, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am, go that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your forehead, forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, right? And so if I was going to think about how do we apply this text um, more than anything, I, I would reference this because the, the beauty of this, right, is, is that it says, uh, repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road. Uh, one of the most profound things that I think that we did as a family growing up was we would get together as pray, to pray um, as a family, we would read the scriptures and we would pray. And like me and my brothers would be all over the place. We'd be lying on the ground, just ready for this to end, ready to move on with our lives, <laughs> right? But the, but the reality of it is that it planted a seed, yes, it right? Is. It planted a seed. And there was, you know, even I was at my boss's house not too long ago. Uh, he had me over for dinner. He has five kids. Uh, his wife homeschools the, the children. But each of them has a unique life verse that they have and that they know. Um, but even as the night went on after we finishing dinner, we, I was having a conversation with him and his, his wife. They were getting to know me a little bit more, right? But um, before we continued the conversation, we stopped. All the kids gra um, uh, sat around us and we took out the Bible. We read the Bible and we prayed, right? So simple, but yet so profound. Amen. Teach your children the word of God. They will not depart from it, right? They will, it will come back around, right? The word of God never returns void, right? How do we apply what Moses is saying in this passage, right? We teach our children who God is. We teach them about Jesus Christ. We repeat those to our children over and over and over again, right? Because your job is just to raise them up in the things of the Lord, and the Lord will take care of it, right? We said we talked about his character. We talked about his faithfulness. We talked about him never leaving us, never forsaking us, right? That's his character. But our job is to raise him up in the things of the Lord. But I love about the Shema, too, though, is that doesn't it sound familiar? You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, right? Doesn't that sound familiar? Don't you, don't you hear that in the New Testament, right? Jesus added to the Shema, um, and it's, it's, it's foundational to the scriptures, right? It is the most important of God's commands, is what Jesus says here more than anything else. But what I love about that is that as Jesus is, is, is discussing the law, he tells us that we can never fulfill the law without him. Yeah, right. Right? right? Like Jesus came, he was the only one that was sinless, that was perfect, right. 
right? That's why we get to stand before God, Amen. right? I get to stand before God because I, I believe that I've accepted Jesus into my heart. So I don't stand before God with the idea of I did this right or I did this right or I did this right. No, it's simply I stand before God because Jesus, I accepted him into my heart. And because Jesus is perfect, right, because he is sinless, right, and because I believe in that, now I can stand before you, God, right? And so I love how the Shema ends here, how, or how Jesus adds on to the Shema in the New Testament um, more than anything else. And this is just one of our, you know, this, the, the truth that I really wanted to impart with you guys today is like, what will our legacy be? What legacy will we leave, right? More than, I think the, the biggest thing, um, and you can go to that last slide here. Again, what will you pass on? What will you pass on to the next generation? Um, I hope it's Christ. You know, I think our lives more than anything is that we testify of the Lord and his character, you know, to our kids so that they get an understanding. Maybe it's, you know, different whatever season you're in, you know, whether it's to your grandkids um, or whether it's just to your friends, your sisters, your brothers, like for my life, I hope that I testify of the character of God. I hope that I, when I'm sitting down and I'm speaking to other people, I, pr I pray that my life would be a reflection of this, right? That you can know the Lord, right? And that, that you can hold on to God's character because he's good. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you, right? This is his character. This is who he is. And that's what our lives should do. They should testify of who the Lord is. And we should not only testify of that verbally with our mouths, but our lives should look like that as well, right? Um, and um, that's all I wanted to, to, to speak to you guys today, short message, um, but that's what the Lord had on my heart more than anything else. Um, but if you guys could stand with me, and we'll just close in prayer really quickly. Um, I do want to give a, an opportunity um, for, the, for the next generation here. I do want to give an opportunity for um, everybody here, right? Because what Moses was trying to pass on more than anything was Christ, right? And that opportunity is here, still here today, right? That if you have never accepted Christ, if you don't know who Jesus is, if you don't know the God who created the heavens and the earth, who loves you so much that he wants to walk in a relationship with you, that opportunity is for you today, right? Um, and so if you guys could just uh, close your eyes, bow your heads with me. Um, again, just close your eyes, bow your heads. Uh, if there is anybody here that has not accepted Christ, that would want to walk into a loving relationship um, and know God in a personal way today, um, if you would just slip up your hand, if that's you, if that's you today, if you just want to walk into a personal relationship and knowing who Jesus is, right? right. Um, Lord God, we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you that this is not about us, that God, we get to simply play a, a part in your, in what you're doing. God, I think about Moses and him passing the torch to the next generation. God, and there were ideals that he left with the, with the people. God, to, to hold on to your word. God, to know that we can always trust your character. God, to simply know that you're a, a God who remains faithful and that your character never changes. God, we can be strengthened. We can be encouraged in you, God. And so, God, we pray that our lives, our lives would represent these truths. God, we pray that our lives, in our lives, we would pass on these truths to the next generation for them to know Christ, God, and, and nothing else. Christ and his self-crucified, God. You are the most important thing. God, apart from you, God, you said that we can do nothing. And so, God, would our lives be transformed by these truths? Would we pass these truths on, God? And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Son, we're proud of you. We share the godly pride your mother and father have. <clears throat> it's not often that you see young men this anchored in the Lord. And it's so good that you can be a testimony not only to your generation, but the generations ahead of you. We want to just pray a blessing over you, Toby, because you're very special to us. Father, we honor this vessel. Even as David fulfilled your purpose for his generation. Thank you for Toby fulfilling your purpose for his generation. And we certainly agree with your word that it's the name of Jesus that transcends generations. But we thank you that in generations to come, when people look back on this generation and his generation, that somewhere in the annals of history, it will be known in that generation that there was a man named Toby who stood out to carry the name of Jesus and to honor that name wherever he went and to touch lives in all he did. We thank you for him, for the work you're using him to do in Chicago, for the work you'll be using him to do when you order him out of Chicago. Lord, we thank you for the testimony he is, that one can stand strong in Jesus at a young age. Lord, to hear him today stand and talk about the times he and his brothers had to hear the word. Mm. They were waiting to go somewhere else and how the word got in him. Mm. And he stands now to testify to the fruit of the word being in him. Thank you for greatly using him. Thank you for the purpose in your heart for his life, for the lives of his dear brothers. Lord, may you ever be glorified in how his life makes a difference in every generation he touches. We thank you for this now and celebrate him before you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated for just a minute. Toby was coming. We knew he was coming. We, we set aside a seat for him to bless and encourage him. But I want to add to that seat today. I have a gift that I'm going to add. And I want you to, however the Lord directs you, we want to just be a blessing to him. If you write a check, write, write a check. If you write a check, make it out to Turning Point Church. Every cent we will add to the seed we have. We want to encourage him. You know, when you see young men like this, we want to bless him. We want to encourage him. His life is making a difference in Chicago. Chicago has one of the highest murder rates in the nation. But he stood today and talked about the things going on in Chicago that don't make the news. How the kingdom is moving in Chicago. And we celebrate that portion that's moving through him. So come on, ushers, and I want you to come and bring whatever seed the Lord puts on your heart. We'll add to the seed we have. We want to encourage this young man in the Lord Father, thank you for speaking to your people, for the seeds that we add, for the way we can encourage your word and your work through this young man. In Jesus' name, come on now. 
Bring whatever the Lord puts on your heart. And let's be a blessing and an encouragement to Toby. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. This is our son. <laughs>